when Noah, our son, was a freshman in high school, he was in a D group, and his D group was looking for some place to serve. Amy hadn't left Brandon at Buddy Break yet because she didn't have someone that could stay with him. She was just sitting waiting for Timothy to be done. Sometimes Brandon would wait in the car while I brought Timothy in, and every once in a while Brandon would come in with me, but then he would shoot right back out the door again because of his anxiety. One week I was there dropping Timothy off, and Brandon just marches to the beat of his own drum and decided he was just gonna sit at one of those tables in the foyer. If Brandon decides he wants to sit, then that's what we do, we sit. <laughs> so as far as I'm concerned, I just have to wait him out. Carrie came along with her buddy, and both of them sat at the table and started talking with us. And we just sat there the whole entire time, talking, having an amazing time. I said, if he doesn't have someone to buddy with, then I would be willing to do that if you think that I can do it. It's a really nice thought and it's super sweet, but she has no idea. But she was super persistent. She was like, nope, he's my buddy. Brandon and I were friends before Amy and I were friends. We tell her that all the time. Through Carrie, then we start meeting Chris and we meet Noah. For him, when he wants me, he goes like this. Noah, he wants you. It was February, and then I think by summer, we were spending time at their house. And I mean, honestly, we just show up. There's not a lot of planning. She only lives like 13 minutes from here. So it's not that difficult just to scoot over there. I graduated, went to a little bit of college, and I started getting into harder drugs. I've been to uh, four or five treatment centers, and I spent four months in the Salvation Army. Even through that, though, Brandon was there, Amy was there. Amy and Brandon came in and visited me. Even though he can't talk, he can't write, I used to get calls from Amy, and he would just scream and make noises, but you know, I could just hear the joy in his voice, just hearing my voice. He helped me get through a lot of that. Amy helped me get through a lot of that. Just to watch him struggle and try to fight against everything that he's had to go through has been hard to watch. And I don't think I've prayed more for any one person ever. Just that Noah would see his value and that he would be able to see himself the way that the Lord sees him. Hopefully he saw that through each one of us, through me, through Brandon, Megan, Timothy, that he saw Christ's love shining through for him, too. In the hardest times, we had to tell Noah that there was something for him to live for. And what we told him that he had to live for was Brandon and kids from Masterpiece Ministry, because that's what his gift is. Brandon needs Noah. Noah is one of the guys that can show up in difficult circumstances, get Brandon to do what Brandon needs to do. I enjoy every second I spend at that church with kids with disabilities. And I was thinking one night, like, what's my purpose? Like, why am I even staying clean and sober right now? You know, like, what am I doing to really benefit anyone? And the first thing that came to my head was the Clark boys and like the impact I've had on them and the impact they've had on me. My kids who are nonverbal, they're not able to read, they're never gonna be able to pick up the Bible and understand all the concepts that are in there. But what they do understand, what they can read, what they can see, what they can feel, is the love of Christ shining through each one of the Duffies. It's not something that I went to school for, it's not something that I have experience in. God just equips you for where he wants you to be. It didn't turn out to be just us serving them. I think we are all way better for knowing the Clarks. He served at Johnny and Friends. I do a program at my school now with special needs. Bethany volunteers at her high school with students with special needs. Noah works for Fox Valley Rock. And that's all because we met Brandon. Working with Brandon teaches you to be patient. <laughs> I think we are all more patient and loving with with everybody. Even you.
that's, uh, that's not the first time I watched that video, but it gets me emotional every time. That's a, that's a sacred thing, church, to, to see that story of what God is doing in people's lives. So would, would you just pray with me before we go in the sermon this morning, just so we can thank God uh, for the amazing opportunities that we all get as a church to, to be a part of his kingdom. Would you pray with me real quick? Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for the gift of service. Lord, we will never truly know the depth uh, of how powerful it is to be used by you, um, to be loved by you, and then to be sent out to love others as you love them. And God, I pray always, always, always that Chapel Street Church would be a place that loves to serve your kingdom, that loves to serve the least of these, that loves to care for those that you care for. Uh, God, would you continue to make us servants, we pray. And Lord, as we come to your word, would you speak with us this morning? Uh, we need your voice more than any other voice. So, Lord, we pray as we, uh, we read now the songs of the soul, God, that you would be with us in this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, a couple of weeks ago, I got to uh, visit my family in England. It's a rare occasion these days, but I love getting to go back because uh, I get to see some of my favorite people in the world, get to see my family. Uh, and here's a picture of me with my nephews and my kids here. Uh, I love getting to see these people, my favorite people in the world. Two of them uh, who are my very favorites are my nephews, Timothy and Ezekiel. Timothy is the guy standing right next to me with his arm around me. Uh, and then Ezekiel is the guy with the squinty eyes right by ne the next to me. Uh, but I, I love them for a lot of reasons. You love your nephews for a lot of reasons. But uh, there's one of my favorite stories in the world is about my nephews. Uh, and uh, it was around the time of my wedding. Uh, then they were very, very young. I've got another picture of them here from the wedding. Uh, so they're a lot smaller, a lot more bald, just like me, which is good. Um, and uh, around the time of my wedding, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on. My family was gracious enough to be able to come out uh, and spend the time with us uh, for a week ahead of time. Uh, and my wife, her family set up my family with a place to stay in the basement of their house. And down in that basement was an antique pinball machine. Uh, and so my uh, nephews were fascinated by this. They were just... Uh, starting to walk, and they were just learning to talk. They had never really talked before, uh, but they were really excited about this pinball machine. Now, pinball machines are not really ideal for a year and a half year old to be messing with, uh, but they would, they would go over and they would play with it all the time. And there was one such occasion that Ezekiel uh, managed to get over there, and uh, you know on the front of pinball machines, they've got the where you put the money in, and he managed to pull open that panel and was kind of messing with all kind of wires in there. Now, I don't want to have to replace a pinball machine. My sister doesn't want to have to replace a pinball machine. So we quickly went over there, and my sister, trying to be a good mom to teach her son not to do these things, she said, Ezekiel, did you do this? Did you pull this off? Uh, and remember, he doesn't really talk yet, but he decides for the very first time in his life to string a sentence together. And he says, no, Timothy did it. <laughs> and he points across the room at poor, innocent Timothy, who was just sat playing the other side of the room, and why did my nephew decide to put his first sentence together as a lie? Because confession is really, really hard. That's why, because confession is really hard. Uh, and as much as we'd like to think that we grew out of that, and when we become adults, you know, we can handle all of our confession really well, the truth is, confession is always hard. It's always hard for us, for a lot of reasons that we're going to talk about this morning. But we are going to look at a song of confession in the Psalms this morning. We're going to look at the journey of one man's uh, traveling through confession and through his sin and what he finds out about the Lord through it. Uh, we're going to look at a song written by King David. Now, if you know anything at all about King David, you know he's a man whose life was littered with moments that required some confession. Uh, he did a lot of amazing things. He's the guy that took down Goliath. He is one of the greatest kings, if not the greatest king of Israel's history. But he is also a man with a lot of flaws, a lot of sin in his life, a lot of broken moments. And we don't know exactly which moment led to the psalm that we're going to read this morning, but we know that it was a moment of brokenness. We know that at a moment in King David's life, he chose to make a mistake. He chose to sin, and out of that, he goes on this journey of confession. So I want to read through this psalm together this morning, because I think in this psalm, in this song of confession, we get a picture of confession that's very different than the ones that we usually have in our mind. The way he talks about it, the way he experiences it, is very different than the way a lot of us experience confession. So let's read this together. This is Psalm 32, and this is what it says. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. 
For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity, and I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Now, most of us don't particularly enjoy the moments where we need to confess sin. Yet here in this psalm, we are receiving a song from David in which he's talking about things like rejoicing. He's talking about shouts of deliverance. He's talking about dancing and singing and shouting. And I think that that's pretty counterintuitive, right? Maybe you are much more holy and righteous people than me, but I have never really shouted and danced when I needed to confess some sin. Usually, I I head the other direction. But I think it's because we forget, or at least we don't see, something that David sees about God. There's something very specific that he understands about God's goodness towards him, and it's this. It's that blessed are the forgiven and the covered. Blessed are the forgiven and the covered. That's what we're told in the opening verses, in verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. I know that we would read that and we say, well, of course, it's, self, it's kind of self-evident. If you are forgiven, that's a good thing. We would say that. But do we experience it regularly? Talking about being blessed for being forgiven. Is that something that we tend to kind of intellectually agree with? Yeah, I, of course, I agree it's a blessed thing to be forgiven. Or is it something more than that? Is it something that travels from our head to our heart, something that we can experience, that we can know truly, I'm blessed because I'm forgiven. Again, for me, there's a lot of times I don't feel that, and it's because there's something that I forget about God. There is a way that I'm seeing God that's off. And so I think today, through this psalm, we're going to see something different. We're going to see something that Proverbs tells us about. This is what Proverbs says in 28, 13, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. See, Psalm 32 is going to unpack for us a journey of confession and the joy of confession. This experience of forgiveness that it leads us to that is better than most else we could ever experience in life. Something that God longs for us to know and experience in our hearts. So this morning, we're going to consider this psalm. We are going to reflect on this psalm, and we're going to look at three things within it. The consequences of unconfessed sin, the pathway of true confession, and then the joy of true confession. So let's talk first about the part that we don't really want to talk about, the consequences of unconfessed sin. Uh, Now, you can probably guess from my comic book stories and my superhero movie stories, I am not the most athletic of the Chapel Street staff. I wasn't a football player at Wheaton when I was uh, in college. I wasn't a basketball star like Brian Coffey. Uh, I didn't do any of those things. In fact, the one time in my life when I decided to get athletic, I played on a soccer team in England. I didn't know the rules, and I, com- I scored an own goal. It was really embarrassing for me, and I'm still as a 32-year-old man trying to recover from the horror of that because <laughs> British people are supposed to know how to play soccer, if nothing else. Um, so I have to try and find ways here at Chapel Street to show off my, uh, my physical skill in other ways. Uh, and one of the ways I like to try and do that is I'd like to try and help out our tech director whenever he's got anything heavy that he needs to carry around. So Eric Robertson has learned to come in and check with Andrew just for his own ego uh, and say, hey, I've got something heavy. Do you need to feel more, like more of a man today? Uh, and so he came into my office this week and he had a TV that he needed to sell. And he said, Andrew do you want to come and help me with this TV? And I said, ha, I've got it. I'm with you. 
So we come out, we uh, see this TV, and it's quite a large TV, uh, but thankfully it had some handles on because the TVs are not always easy to carry. And we pulled it up, and I was quite surprised by how, uh, how easy it was, actually. I mean, it wasn't light, but it wasn't awful. Uh, and so he says, you're good? And I said, hey, what do I look like? I'm not Jeff Frazier. I can carry a TV. <laughs> so we uh, head inside, and uh, the further we go, the longer I carry it, the heavier it starts to get. And my hands start to tremble a little bit. He says, you good? I'm like, I'm good. I'm good. So we keep going. We've got to go downstairs. So we make it to the elevator. And we have this moment. I don't know whether you've ever had these moments. You're carrying something with someone. And I'm thinking, well, he's going to put it down while we're in the elevator. He doesn't put it down. Why would you not put it down? So I'm, but if, if he's not going to put it down, I can't put it down. Because then I'm going to look like the weakling. And the whole thing is about making me look like I'm strong. So I hold on to it. My hands are trembling more and more. We managed to get downstairs to the room we're going, and when I put that TV down, I can feel every muscle in my back, and I can't feel my fingertips because they've, they've got the circulation cut off. It was horrible, and that was the day I realized it's okay not to be athletic. It's okay not to be physical. I can be the comic book nerd. That's okay, but here's something else that I realized is when you carry something for a very, very long time, it can start to have all kinds of effects on you. And sin is no different. Actually, sin can have very physical effects on us when we carry it for a very long time, when we hold it up inside. David gives us this really vivid diagnosis of what happens when we have unconfessed sin in our life. This is what he says. He says, when I kept silence, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. What a graphic depiction. It's kind of scary to read that, to see what happens when we have unconfessed sin in our life. But as dark and as fearful as what that describes is, I think that this is a moment of Scripture's kindness to us. David is being kind to us by telling us the truth of what sin can do in our lives. What unconfessed sin can do to our hearts, our minds, and even our bodies. His depiction is really physical, isn't it? Bones wasting and groaning. I want to be careful not to make the mistake when we read this to think that what David's telling us is that unconfessed sin is always going to make us sick. And that therefore, anytime you're sick in your life, it's because you haven't confessed enough sin. That's not what David's saying. What he is saying is that unconfessed sin does have the possibility of affecting us in really, really serious ways. If we were to read the research of someone called Professor Slapian and Mason from Columbia Business School, they would tell us something that I think Scripture tells us as well. See, they did a research study not too long ago, and they decided to do their research on the effect of secrets on the human body. They wanted to see what happens to human beings when we keep secrets. So they asked 1,200 different Americans online and 312 in person about the secrets that they keep in their life. This is what they found. They found that on average, uh, the Amer- um, every average American keeps about 13 secrets to themselves of various types and degrees. Some of these examples of the secrets that are kept include infidelity, fantasies, betrayals of trust. And about five of those 13 is a secret that they have never told anyone in their lives. Something buried way down deep. And then they found that most people who keep a secret even if it's relatively minor, like faking an illness to get off work or something serious like an extramarital affair, they found that there was a profound amount of effects on the body. All kinds of effects. They found that psychologically, when you keep secrets, when you bury things, that it causes you to revisit them and have a lower sense of well-being. So in this study, they found that many of the participants had at least some level of anxiety or depression in their life. Because there was some weight that they were carrying that they'd never told anyone in their life. There was others whose secrets were beginning to have a physical effect on them. Now I'm not surprised at all by this study because it's just telling us something that the Bible tells us. And we know that God's word is true and kind to us. That it always tells us the truth. And it tells us through David's song that unconfessed sin harms us in all kinds of ways. But scripture doesn't just tell us what happens when we don't confess our sin. It tells us what happens when we do. In the letter of James in the New Testament, James, one of Jesus' 
good friends, tells us this. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you might be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. See, if hidden sin can cause harm, then exposing sin heals us. It restores us. It sets right what's gone wrong. And I want you to listen to God's motivation in giving us confession, giving us this opportunity to confess and this gift of confession. He wants us to be healed. See, the the cornerstone, the birthplace of confession is the belief that God wants good for you. That God wants good for you. That he wants healing, that he wants restoration, that he wants freedom. God's desire for us is not that we would carry burdens and weights and revisit all these times in which we feel that we failed him and failed others. God wants to deal with that. Because God's ultimate desire for us is that we would find joy in him. That we'd find joy and freedom in him. See, some of us run 180 degrees from confession, and it's because we don't have that cornerstone. We're not starting from the place that says, I believe God wants good for me in every situation, even in my worst moments. And that's why we need to walk the pathway of true confession, so that we can learn what our God desires for us. I had another embarrassing moment this week on top of my TV incident. Uh, I was picking up my son from preschool this week, and uh, he gets stamps on his card uh, at school for doing various things. And when you get enough stamps on your card, you get to pick a a toy from the little prize bucket. And because he's a five-year-old boy, he decided he wanted to pick the slime. He wanted to get a little bucket of slime. So he gets this little tiny tub of blue slime. He brings it home. I'm not really thinking about it because I'm a dumb dad. And I'm, we're just driving home, we're going to have fun, you know, I'm probably just going to get on my phone and play some Castle Crashes or some dumb game for a little bit, and he can play with his slime. So we get home, and uh, he says to me, he says, Dad, can I play with my slime again? Because there's no real brain inside this skull. I said, yeah, knock yourself out, have fun, play with that slime, it's going to be good slime. So we're kind of hanging out, I'm not really paying attention, and then after about five minutes, I hear my son Jonathan say to me, hey, I can't really get it out. So I'm just going to put it away. And a kind of a few seconds pass where I don't really think about what I just said. And then all of a sudden I said, wait, he said he can't, he can't get it out. I was like, okay, what do you mean you can't get it out? So I run over there and on the back of his collar, he's got a whole bunch of the slime on the collar. Uh, and he had this white shirt as well. It's gone all blue. And I'm, I'm thinking, oh, we'll just put the slime on and it'll, it'll pull it off. But no, that just jams more in there. So this is not going well for me. And as I'm trying to, to do this, he says, no, 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 not the shed, the couch. <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, please, no. <laughs> so I look down on the couch, and there's this little circle right on the couch of slime. And right as I look down, it is, I'm aware that my wife is getting home in about five minutes. <laughs> I'm like, I cannot be caught being the dumb dad. I've been the dumb dad a lot of times this week. This cannot be one of them. I'm not wrecking the couches. I'm not going to be that guy. So I'm, I decide, because I'm dumb, oh, well, if it didn't work on the collar, it'll work on the couch. So let's get the slime and start dabbing it. Makes it worse. So then I start thinking, I, again, I'm not, I'm not going to be caught. What can I do with this? And when you've got little young kids, there's a myriad of different stains on your couches. And you think, well, maybe this just happened like two weeks ago and we never noticed. Maybe it's not dad's fault. So right as I'm deciding I'm going to sin against my wife and lie to her, uh, Janae comes in through the door and I said, listen, don't be mad. Don't be mad. I was dumb. I didn't check and I let Jonathan play with his slime and now there's a little snot circle on our couch that I can't get out. And rather than get really mad at me because my wife is a gracious, Jesus-loving woman, she says, you know what? Don't worry about it. Kids get stuff on couches all the time. And I felt really cheated because I was about to sin in order to cover this up. And my wife, being all like Jesus, being holy and forgiving me. (laughs) But here's what happened in that moment. I had an expectation of how my wife was going to react. I decided in my head she was going to be mad. She was going to be really frustrated with me. I was embarrassed about what had happened. And so I decided, well, I can't just be honest about it. And sometimes, as silly as that story is, don't we approach God in the same way? Don't we decide in our hearts, God is going to be disappointed with me. He's going to be angry with me. Other people are going to be disappointed with me. They're going to be angry with me. And so the best thing to do is not to expose what's gone wrong, but to hide it, to bury it, to find some excuse for it. 
But here's what happens when David confesses his sin to the Lord. He says in verse 5, I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely, in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. There's a lot to this section of the psalm, so I want to go through it just piece by piece. I want to start with what happens in verse 5, where David decides to acknowledge his sin before the Lord, to be honest about it, to not hide it, but to expose it. He says, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity, and this is what happens. You forgave the iniquity of my sin. Now, I hope you catch what happened in those moments. It doesn't seem like much, but here's what happens is David confessed his sin and God forgave it. There was no 12-step process in between that. There was no moment in which God said, okay, we're going to have to deal with this. Here's what I need you to do, David. I need you to go make this sacrifice. I need you to go and perform these rituals. And until then, you can't be in my presence, David. You can't be near me. What does God do the instant that, that David exposes his sin to him? He forgives it. The very moment he exposes it, it's forgiven. It's covered. And notice as well that there's kind of a contrast. At the beginning, David says, blessed is the one whose sin is covered. And David says here in verse 5, I did not cover it. I did not cover my sin because God wanted to cover it for him. See, Sometimes we complicate things so very much. And the truth is, if we confess our sin, God is faithful to forgive every time. Even in your worst moment of sin, I want you to know you can approach the presence of God. You can come to him. Sometimes there's religious traditions out there that may want to throw other steps in the process that make us feel that we've got to do something in order to buy back God's love or appease him before he look at us. But the truth is, when we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. Now, I don't think that we should mistake simple for easy. It's simple to confess our sin, but it's not always easy. We're told in 1 John 1, 8 through 10, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. The word in the New Testament that is used for confession is a Greek word, homologio. And what homologio means is to say the same, to say the same. So anytime we read in the New Testament about God's call and command to us to confess our sins, what he's asking us to do is to say the same thing about our sin as he says, to say the same thing about our sin as God says. And that's not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to acknowledge to ourselves and to others that we've made a mistake that we have fallen, that we've tripped, that we've gone off track. And the reason why it's not easy is because we become terrified of what other people are going to say. We think, well, what would people say about me? What would they think about me if they knew that I'd done this? If they saw that thing I did or that way I treat that person or the way I reacted to my neighbor, how would they think about me? But that's not the only fear we have. We even have a fear about how we'll think about ourselves. We don't want to admit what's gone wrong because we know in our souls that if we say that about ourselves, if we say the same thing, then that means we're not necessarily who we want to be or should be. We think things like, I'm unforgivable. I'm a failure. I've let God down. I've let others down. I've let people I love down. And rather than face that, we try and bury it so we can run away from it. But I wanted this morning to look at an encouragement from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Corinthians. Here's what he says. He says, with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself for I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. 
Here's what Paul is seeing in this little section of Scripture. He's seeing that the most important assessment about him is not what other people think. It's not even what he thinks about himself. It's what God thinks about him. Paul's coming back to the cornerstone of confession, what God says about him. He even says, I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. What he's seeing is, I'm not saying that I'm innocent. I'm not saying that I've never made a mistake. Even if my conscience tells me I'm good, what matters to me is what God says about it. I want to say the same thing about my sin as what God says. That's what matters. And what is God's assessment of us? He loves us. He cares for us. God is aware that we are sinners. It's not a surprise to him. When he looks on this room right now, he's not shocked by the things that he sees in our lives. He knew about them. And that is why he sent his son. That is why Jesus clung to a cross for us. Why he was nailed there is because God knows our problems and our mistakes and our flaws and our errors. And he said, it's not enough for me to not love you. I'm going to come and I'm going to deal with that for you. See, if that's the assessment that God has for us, if he loves us while we are still sinners, then what reason do we have to not approach him and confess our sin? If in our worst moments he chose to give us his son, why would we ever want to run and hide someplace else? And that's what David believes. That's why David says in verse 7, you are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. You, you, you. See, the sense that we have in ourselves to cover our sin, to get rid of our sin, is not wrong. The problem is, is where we run to hide it. Do we run to ourselves? Do we run to others? Do we try and bury it? Or do we run to God so that he can be our hiding place? So that he can be our covering? Do you remember at the very start of God's story, Adam and Eve in the garden, they sin, and what's the first thing they do? They run, they hide, and they cover themselves. And if you follow that story, just a few more verses, what we find is that God actually sacrifices an animal so that he can cover them. What God's saying in that moment is, don't try and cover yourself, come to me, because there is a sacrifice that can cover you. I want to cover you. And listen to how God receives us. David says, you receive me with shouts of deliverance. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. God's not wanting to shame us in our sin. He's wanting to deliver us. He's wanting to rescue us. David finishes this little section of the psalm with something quite interesting. He says in verse 9, be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle or it will not stay near you. David's point to us here, he's actually changed the the voice of the psalm. Initially, he's talking about his reactions, but all of a sudden he changes to God's voice and he gives us this instruction, be not like a horse or a mule without understanding. David's point to us is that when we don't confess our sin, it's akin to an animal that has to be led. It has to have a bit in its mouth, otherwise it's gonna wander off into danger. You see, when we don't confess our sin, we are wandering from the presence of the one who loves us and can care for us and can cover us. We're wandering into danger. And what David is saying is don't be like that. Don't have to be forced back onto the path of safety, back into the presence of the one who is your safety. Come, look at who he is and stay near him. I think there's three things that we can do to walk this path of of true confession and to stay near the one who is our safety. First, we need to confess consistently. We need to confess consistently. We need to normalize what it means to bring our sins to light. It needs to be a regular rhythm in our life. We don't need to just wait for the huge moments when things go completely off track. We need to, every morning, come into God's presence and be honest and say the same thing about ourselves. We are sinners in need of your grace. We need to confess clearly. We need to confess consistently, but we also need to confess clearly. I've had a habit in my life uh, at times of of doing what I call Picasso confession. If you've ever seen a, a picture by Picasso, you're like, I don't really know what this is. Well, sometimes I confess and I'm so unclear about what it is to God and to others that we don't really know what it is Andrew's done that needs to be dealt with, that needs to be forgiven. God wants me to be clear with him so that he can cover all of it. 
so that I can say the same thing. Not so that I can excuse it. Not so that I can minimize it. Not so that I can blame it on circumstances. But to come and say the same thing. To be clear about my sin. And lastly, we need to confess communally. Communally. Sometimes it's, it's a lot easier, isn't it, to come into God's presence and confess to God but not to look into the eye of another human being and be honest about our sin and say the same thing as God says. But actually, there's a joy in confession to others. And here's what it is. When you confess your sin to another human being, you can look into the eyes of someone and have a living picture of God's grace to you, of how someone can receive your sin and forgive you. And this, by the way, is why we as Christians should always have grace and tenderness when someone chooses to have the courage to obey God and confess to us. Because that can be a really difficult and frightening moment. There could be some hard decisions, some hard consequences, and so all the more reason why in the moment someone has the courage to obey, we should receive that with grace and tenderness. So that we can be a picture to them of the God who loves them, who covers their iniquity. Because there's a better reality to be enjoyed than the one that we paint for ourselves about confession. That's the joy of true confession. Here's how David finishes his psalm. He says, Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. We go back to the cornerstone of confession that God desires good for us. In case it's a surprise for anyone in this room this morning, I just want to be honest, I'm a sinner. I'm a pretty bad one. There's a lot of moments in my life that I have not loved my neighbor as my I have not loved my neighbor as myself. I have certainly not loved God as he deserves. A lot of moments that I try to hide from God and run from God. But thankfully, by God's grace and a little bit of pushing, he put me in a community in which I learned a lot more about confession. There was a time in my life in college where uh, some pretty serious things had happened. I got off course. And I called myself a Christian at the time as well, so what made me feel worse is that I was supposed to be a lot better than this, and I wasn't. And so I did what a lot of us do, which is, let's hide this. But God came, and through Psalms like Psalm 32, through Psalms like Psalm 51, through these songs of the soul, he reminded me that he is good, desires good for me, and wants to set me free. And so somehow, I managed to find the courage, because of God's grace, to go and tell someone. And in that moment, I found for the very first time in my life a picture of what it truly means to be forgiven. Not to just say in my mind, I've been forgiven, but in my heart, experience the love of a God who says, I see your sin, and I still love you. Let me cover that for you with the blood of my son. Church, this is what confession has been given to us for that we might be freed from the burdens that we carry on our shoulders, that we might know the love of a God who surrounds us with shouts of deliverance, who causes us, as David tells us, to sing and shout and trust in the love of God. And this morning, that's God's charge to us through this psalm. So in a moment, we're going to invite the band to come up after I pray, and we're going to sing together. We're going to sing together to the one who is our covering, who loves us. And remind ourselves of what this psalm sings to us this morning. Would you pray with me? Father God, we love you so very much. Forgive us for the times when we have not trusted in your love, where we have forgotten that you surround us with shouts of deliverance. Lord, come and be our covering. Come and remind us of the joy of confession, that we might be set free to know you as you are. We pray in Jesus' name.